So my name is Jeroen van der Sluis and I'm nowadays in Bergen uh, University in Norway. And I will give a very short version of a presentation I gave earlier on the Significant Digits uh, Conference, uh, also at GRC, but then we had it in Brussels. It was on the responsible use of uh, numbers and quantification. And the problems we see here are, I think the, the previous title was The Extinction of Craft Skills with Numbers. So we see that when we use numbers, and we need a lot of numbers to legitimate policies, uh, all the environmental agencies produce numbers all the time, and without these numbers, governments seem not secure enough to make decisions. But in this process, a lot of uh, background information on where these numbers come from, what are the problems in quantification, what are the assumptions on which the quantification is based, what are the uncertainties, all this information is lost, and then numbers run wild uh, in society. I will give some examples. So the first example is uh, uh, a paper that did a meta-analysis of all the studies on extinction risks of species when the climate will change. So they looked in all the published studies and then came up with a figure, and the figure is 7.9% of the species on our planet uh, will get extinct if we don't stop climate change. So here you find the number. Overall, they predicted 7.9% of the species will go extinct. So what happens if we throw this number uh, over the fence? If we look at where the number comes from, we see here uh, a summary of these, uh, what was it, 131 studies uh, that the study brought together. <laughs> and then we see 30 studies out of 131 showed no extinction, 0%. And there were a few studies that showed more than half of the species will get extinct. And then you see there are some categories in between. And then you take a statistical average of the whole <laughs> distribution of studies. And this is the number that we throw over the fence into the society and the policymaker community, what comes in the newspaper, uh, and so on. Now, if you read the paper, it was published in Science, it is completely unclear what year we are talking about, what year is the, will the climate change. It's completely unclear what temperature change is assumed, because every study used a different scenario for the temperature change and a different time horizon. And they even didn't agree on what species are. <laughs> and still they are efforts. So in the efforts, we don't even understand what the unit is. So even the unit is uncertain. Where the individual species were clear that it was a percentage of the sample. So they looked, for instance, at 112 different species. And then there was a percentage of these 112 studied species that were at risk of extinction. And then you generalize to all species, but can you do that? So how many species are there if we only take eukaryotic species? Uh, one other attempt of quantification where we have the same problem uh, is 8.7 million, plus or minus 1.3 million. <laughs> but if we include prokaryotic species, we have no idea. We don't even know how many of them are around. M maybe you know you're a biologist or, yeah? <laughs> Well, no, you're not, but you could, uh, could know something like this. I don't know. So we have no idea even what the unit is. So. But still, these numbers are uh, crossing the disciplinary boundaries, are thrown over the fence from science into society, uh, and we lose the notion of where these numbers come from, uh, how they were composed, uh, and what we can do with these type of numbers. <coughs> Now, this has to do with what Jerry Ravitz uh, introduced uh, earlier today, with that we are trained to believe or to expect that science can just answer every question we pose to scientists, uh, and that we can actually quantify it, and that we can quantify with some precision, uh, and that ultimately we will know the precise number uh, in many digits. 7.9% is two digits. Uh, 
which is hyper, hyper precise for this type of quantities. And if we, well, if we cannot know the precise number yet, well, then we give a confidence interval of 95%. And we give, for instance, for climate sensitivity, we give a number range, one and a half to four and a half degrees of warming when the climate, uh, uh, when the CO2 doubles, uh, etc. And it seems that it is hard to make climate policies without magic numbers, like a two degree warming limit or a one and a half degree now after Paris. And that is then uniquely transferred into a unique carbon budget for the world. <laughs> and that's another magic number. Uh, and then uh, we know what to do and we have a legitimate basis for policymakers because the science has spoken and we have a number. But then we lose all the problems behind these numbers. So we need something called craft skills with numbers and knowledge quality assessment. And we need to understand that uncertainty is more than a number and that it does may not work to give a range because the range may not capture all the relevant dimensions of uncertainty. It usually only captures the first bullet point in this list of dimensions. And the first three come from the classic book that we all should read and reread, Uncertainty and Quality in Science for Policy by Silvio and Cherry from 1990 which actually gives you the basis for craft skills with numbers and the new subsystem, which uh, if the gong doesn't kill me <laughs> before <laughs> I'm there, uh, which I can briefly introduce. So we also have methodological problems in, in the numbers, the unreliability of the method we used. We have epistemological problems with our limits to our ability to know and understand the limits of knowledge that limit uh, the, the known and the unknown unknowns, you could say. And then we have also something like societal dimensions of uncertainty where uh, we actually also uh, need to negotiate with society uh, trust in our numbers, uh, perceived reliability uh, of the studies we throw over the fence. So here's another example of a number and here was a problem. This is uh, in a pollutant, an air pollutant, uh, ammonia coming from intensive cattle breeding and agriculture. Uh, and we had a policy in the Netherlands to reduce emissions. And let's say the policy target was a 10% reduction in a couple of years. But the precision by which we can measure the emission of the number of, the, of this pollutant is 30%. So in a given year, <laughs> we have an uncertainty of 30% about the emission. And we want to reduce in a number of years, maybe 10 years from now, this number by 10%. So then the precision in the policy target has a complete mismatch with the precision by which we can monitor the emission. So if the reference year were 1995 and we look at the emission in 1995 and we look at successive editions of the State of Environment report and look up the emission in 1995, then you see what you see here. So if we take the first time it was reported, it was about 150 million kilograms. But then in 1999, there was a recalculation of the emission in that year in the past, and it suddenly was 30% higher. <coughs> now, there is no measurement instrument to measure the flux from an agricultural system to the atmosphere of ammonia, so it is modeled. And the model has as input number of cattle, uh, like the number of pigs, the number of cows, number of chicken, etc. And then for each agricultural subsystem, there is an emission factor for how much from this subsystem per cow, per cattle, goes into the atmosphere, etc. Uh, and we also quantify the time slot, and this uh, <laughs> legitimizes some decisions here uh, to intervene. Yeah? <laughs> so we may have a problem here. Uh, but we see here that, uh, well, we need some craft skills with numbers, and NUSAP might be uh, a first uh, step forward to, to do this, because there we go beyond just the notational system with a number, a unit, and a 95% confidence interval or some spread, and we add some other information about the uncertainty, like an expert judgment on the reliability based on well, what the status of this type of knowledge is, uh, and pedigree, which is the, the most innovative part uh, of the, the new subsystem, where, where we systematically assess 
the scientific status of, of this number. So the weaknesses in terms of the empirical basis behind it, uh, the, the methodological rigor by which these numbers were constructed, etc. So it gives us a way to communicate uh, uh, clearly uh, these type of problems in the numbers before we throw them over the fence. So it's like when you give a medicine to a patient, you give it with a patient information leaflet, how to use, how not to use this medicine. For this, the same way, we can give numbers with a patient information leaflet, which should guard us against incompetent uses uh, of these type of numbers. So I will skip the rest of it, what I prepared. <laughs>